and welcome to the Voice of the Veteran Show, the number one show in the nation for firsthand veteran experience. My name is Gail Ockeltree, Army Airborne Veteran, along with my buddy, Nicholas Cormier III. There he is. Say hey. hey How you all doing? Nicholas Cormier III, uh, back for another episode of Voice of the Veteran. All right. Number 16, sucker. I'm telling you, number 16. And we've got MC Franklin in the back, our producer. Are you back there, MC? I got to make sure before we go any further, because I'm telling you, if oh, MC. Thanks, okay. Okay, he's there, so we can go ahead and do this show. Hey, this is going to be cool today because, uh, you know, you remember, Nicholas, uh, Elvis Presley? You, you know, I know you're too too young for that. I am, too. Elvis Presley is more my mother's generation and everything. But Elvis Presley was a veteran, and that's why I just wanted to tell the joke about him today because it's relevant. So he was in the military and like, oh, I don't know, into the 50, 1958 or so, something like that. And so you know how he just kind of disappeared at one point and everybody was looking for him. It was like a big deal. Did he actually die or is he hiding out somewhere because he's sick and tired of all the autographs and all the adulation and stuff around his career? So basically uh, people say, since he's a veteran and stuff, and we're talking about wait, waiting times and everything, they said that they finally found Elvis Presley in a VA waiting room. And the reason is because he was safe there because nobody ever, ever goes in there. You know what I mean? We're just there waiting and waiting and waiting. So anyway, that's where Elvis Presley ended up. And I'm sure that's a true story. I just wanted to share it with you. I can only imagine the wait times were uh, very long back then. I grew up, I'm a military brat. I know about the oh, yeah. history of VA wait time. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And wait times, of course, as you already know, Nicholas, are a piece of, uh, you know, our general access to medical care. And there's a there's different kinds of wait times. You know, there's the, there's the time, uh, you know, when you want to make an appointment and then you have to wait for a couple of weeks. That's all that crow fly stuff. You know what I mean? It, you know, you have 30 days and got to get in there before 30 days or they send you out to the community care network or whatever like that. But then there's the waiting time when you're actually in the waiting room waiting. So there's mm -hmm. two different kinds of waiting. So veterans are always complaining about the length of time that, you know, uh, that they sit in a waiting room for an already scheduled appointment. Now, in the past, that was terrible. Now, I can tell you for a fact, I hate to say this, but back in the 80s, the late 1980s, you know, like 80, 89, 92, right around in there. I mean, I actually was in a waiting room all afternoon long. It was more than three hours for a scheduled appointment. Now, the, the doctor didn't have an emergency or anything, and I never could figure out what goes on. It's an amazing, amazing thing. And so vets are always complaining about wait times because, you know, I think sometimes uh, these days, it's not the same at all. It's like maybe the clerk didn't get the vet checked in properly and it's okay for us to go check and double check and make sure. Or maybe the doctor, you know, like Elvis, you know, didn't come out and see if that veteran was asleep in the chair, you know, I mean, and they just didn't answer up, you know, there's all kinds of things that can happen. So now we can check on the wait times at the VA. And this is really cool because uh, why are wait times? Oh, also, I want to mention this too. Wait times can be different for different veterans. OK, because there's a thing called you know, you, you, this is obvious when I say it, but you, you, I know you're going to go. Oh, well, yeah, obviously. But um, there's a thing called an established veteran. Now, that's somebody who's already been signed up in the system, is ready to go and is seen an ongoing doctor several times. I mean, they already have a continuity of care going on with a doctor, you know. But then there's a new veteran. And a new veteran is going to have to work their way through what's called the eligibility process and the intake process. And, you know, it's exhausting, but that's true at any hospital. 
It's not just the VA, you know. So now what, you know, what if you can't wait to be seen? I mean, what's the first thing, you know, something's an emergency, you would call 911, right? And you go to the nearest emergency room or whatever and get, get the emergency taken care of. So for situations that are non-emergency non but urgent, uh, such as, I don't know, the treatment of minor stuff like, I don't know, illness, a runny nose, a sore throat, you know, minor skin infection, stuff like that. You know, the VA offers urgent care uh, at many of the VA facilities. And I guess CBOX, I, I, I don't know whether to say that or not. Just do, you know, it's a good thing for us to bring up next time. Do, do CBOX have emergency care? You know, my sense, I, would, be, my sense would be yes, but then again, I well, I'm looking up right now, and one of them says closed. So yeah, I know. I just didn't <laughs> want to, well, I didn't want to say that, but that's okay. But I don't want to say that the C box have emergency care if that's not the case. You know what I'm no, saying? I'm I'm looking at it right now, Gail. I do not see anything that tells me yes immediately. So um, a nurse would be our option then. So yes. telehealth is like same day surfaces, surfaces, services, or face to face with your doctor. Uh, you could do, I you know that makes sense. So C box, that's interesting. That's something that we'll bring up on another show or something. Emergency care places to directly go for emergency care because that's important. And you yes. know messaging your doctor now that. For a new veteran, it's not going to happen because they haven't been put into the system and they don't have a, a what you jigger, my healthy vet account, you know, so they're not going to be set up for that engagement with a doctor yet. So um, and on my healthy vet, you know, you at, at, or if you call tell nurse, tell tell a nurse, uh, you can also set up an appointment at the VA for a couple of days away, you know, they'll help you do that kind of stuff. Now I'm going to go ahead and put this, this access, um, you know, in the chat box. And also um, here's another one that this is really cool because you can now go online at this links that I just put in the chat box and actually check to see what the wait time is for the clinic that you're interested in going to. So you can actually plan your not life and not be sitting there singing with Elvis. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, 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 the difference between what was at the VA and what is now is night and day in my experience. I don't go to the doctor and sit and wait forever. You know, it, it's really a nice thing. So, um, you know, how is it that the VA would collect information for these sites? I mean, how do they know how long we're waiting? You know, now they actually uh, have like third party leaders and experts and, and people that collect this kind of information now. And um, they're actually think tanks on this kind of subject. And, um, you know, there are so many reports. I mean, they're dry as hell. I mean, they're just awful. And now to just, you know, put this, you know, they don't just pull this information out of their, well, let me reframe that before I go on any further. Uh, the VA... <laughs> Pull it, pull it out of what, Gail? I'm yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me restate well, it. But, but Gail, just to say, I was looking up, I saw an example with the uh, just a random CBOC, VA Granberry uh, Community-Based Outpatient Clinic. And what I was able to find there, emergency slash urgent care, it says if you have a life-threatening emergency, immediately call 911. It also says if you have medical concerns after hours and cannot wait until your next appointment, like you said, Call the telenurse. I placed that in the chat. That's 1-888-252-9970. And a trained professional is available 24-7 to answer your non-emergent healthcare questions. And it says, if you or a loved one finds themselves in crisis, 
Call the VA Suicide Prevention Hotline, available 24-7 at 1-800-273-8255. That's also in the chat, too. That's perfect. Thank you. Because I just wanted to stop. Like you said, we want to tell everybody, you know, right stuff. We don't, we don't want to send anybody on any goose chases. So where were we? Oh, we were pulling it out of our whatever. Yeah, well, I just pulled that out of the internet, I guess. You did, what? didn't you? You, you just gave us an example of pulling it out. All right. Oh, Lord. What? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, anyway, so I hear I'll do the dry version. I'll do the dry VA version. So the VA has like uh, evidence-based info research to develop and calculate innovative solutions to systematic challenges that they face in supporting the veteran population. How's that? I mean, you know, I mean, that's how they write. I mean, I swear to God, you know, it's it, it's it's such boring writing that it could clinically be considered an anti-inflammatory. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it just makes me crazy. It makes me nuts. Okay. Now, I've got some information right here, and I got to read a little bit of it. I mean, it's just a couple of lines. But it, I just want to tell everybody... Do you, were you, did you ever do any of those tablet interviews when you came out of a clinic and there's somebody there with a tablet asking you 10 questions, you know, and that was called truth point. Did you ever even see anybody doing that? Cause they did do a lot of it. I know I have experienced the tablets, but honestly, that's, oh, that's so you see. the veteran family wellness center. Oh. Uh, and that's usually. Uh, you know, I'm sure you have too, but, uh, you know, before I'm seen sometimes I, I, at the Veteran Family Wellness Center, I, I'll do a tablet survey. But That's not interesting because I never did one. I just knew that they were doing them. I mean, I, yeah, would I have, done, I have done them. People. Oh, okay. Well, that's cool. So one of those that was, you know, used a lot in my experience, because I saw the reports and stuff, was called Truth Point. And now it's called Veteran Single signals, not singles, signals. And I just talked to um, Michael Mandragon last week, who's in charge of all this stuff. I think he's parked at Sepulveda. And um, he said that they changed that and it's now called veteran single. Signals, S-I-G-N-E-L, signals. Yeah. signals. Now, Several years ago, and I think they still have it, it's called the SHEP Report, S-H-E-P, and that's Survey of Healthcare Experience of Patients. But it comes out quarterly, and um, it's good information, but it's not immediate information about wait lists and how long you have to wait at a hospital. And then they have what's called the SAIL Report, that's S-A-I-L, and that's Strategic Analytics for improvement and learning. I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we're a teaching hospital at, uh, you know, at the VAs and stuff. And so that's analytics for learning. And then pretty much all hospitals have what's called CHAPS, C-A-C-A-H-P. It's Consumer Assessment of Health Providers and System Survey. Now the medical, that's kind of like a medical industry standard, that test. But that's that kind of test or that kind of survey rather is given to inpatients who are in for surgery. And after they get home, you usually get that kind of thing in the mail and you fill out that little survey. So the link in the chat box now is new and it's a tool so that veterans can go and put in their VA, like since we're here, I'll just use VA West LA, and you click on that, you put in the information, what clinic you wanna see, what provider, and it will tell you during the past 30 days, veterans have waited this period of time, this long in order to see a doctor. And it's current information, not a quarterly report or something, but this is like right now kind of information. This is kind of exciting because, um, like I said, uh, there are reports that, you know, on many different topics for crying out loud. And, you know, when, when you're sitting around in the waiting room and somebody's talking about, well, I heard that this and that, and I heard that you had to wait forever at the VA. Well, guess what? You can look it up right now 
and write from other veterans' experience, know how long you're going to have to wait, you know? And if Elvis had had this, he would have been caught, you know, they we would have been knowing where he was way back when, because somebody would have been talking to somebody in the waiting room. You know what I'm saying? So also, um, my experience is that, you know, if you use that kiosk, you know you're checked in and you don't have to deal with that clerk. Now, I'm not saying all clerks are that way, but stuff happens. Every once in a while, people don't get checked in properly and they're sitting there waiting and getting pissed off and whatever else. But if you use the kiosk, now I can use my VA card at the kiosk and I can use my military ID at the kiosk. It takes them both. And you can make changes and add your phone number in at the kiosk now to be able to use the new VA Notify. That kiosk will allow you to change your phone number so you can get texts via VA Notify. Where, where is that kiosk? Yeah, the only kiosk I've seen is like at the lab. You know, I, I when I'm signing in at the lab with my card, I haven't seen a kiosk or I haven't been aware of one in, when I've gone to appointments. It, is it located in the center of the hospital or does each- No, um, no, they're in all the clinics. What I'm thinking is, what I'm hearing from you is, see now, let's just take dental. Now I go to dental appointments in the hospital and there's a kiosk right there next to the clerk. You can talk to the clerk or you, you can put your card in the kiosk and punch in the information and I'm here. And you know, I'm here in the waiting room. Maybe they don't have kiosks over in North Campus where you're going to the dentist. You know what I'm saying? No, no, no. I'm 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 saying when I go to when I go to the lab, there's a kiosk. Uh, I can't go to. Unfortunately, I don't get to go to the dentist where I love to go to the dentist in VA Building 213 on the West LA VA campus anymore. Ah. Now I have to go to the. You know, I'm service connected at a percentage to where I have to go to the main hospital. But I'm saying I haven't seen them in the main hospital either. Uh, and I just might not be looking for them. I have Look checked in uh, with with the clerks and the clerks, are, you know, generally I've had great service with the clerks where I go. I would say there's two instances where I've had to wait a long time. One, and it usually deals with staffing. It's usually a staffing issue. It's usually that there's doctors calling in sick or there's only one doctor on staff or there's, and that's been, you know, one time I was, I was trying to do an urgent care. I was very sick. Uh, this was at the Sepulveda VA and there weren't enough doctors on. And, and uh, unfortunately I, I dealt with that through the patient experience office, but I had to wait an extraordinarily long time. The other time was dermatology. I think I had to wait maybe an hour and that was because there was only one dermatologist that was working that day. And I oh. ended up being seen. I did get up and check with the clerk to see, hey, what's going on? Well, you should. I, I did do that. I did check sure. with the clerk. Everything's fine. We just don't have a lot of dermatologists on staff. We've got one dermatologist. It's going to be a little longer. Please wait. Um, and it was right within the time I needed it to be so I didn't have to cancel or, or go on to my next uh, appointment or meeting. You know, that dermatology clinic is, I mean, just to deviate a little bit here, that dermatology clinic is different in every state that I've ever been in. And the biggest dermatology clinic that I've seen personally is in California because everybody's out at the beach and out in the sun all the time. And they're in there getting stuff burned off and everything, you know, because it's like, oh, my gosh, I've been to the beach too much, you know. So I wouldn't get nothing burned off. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So now I, I find here some alternatives to uh, in-person medical appointments. I'm going to read a couple of those right here. There's a list. You know, we were talking about telenurse and all that. And I, I forgot that I had a list here. I was just chatting it up. Did we share the number? I, I, there is that number for telenurse. I don't know if it's a number for everyone, Gail, but I have that 1-888-252-9970 number for the telenurse. Now, oh, I don't really? know if that's a nationwide number that everyone can reach the telenurse at, but that's what was provided at the Granberry uh, CBOC. Oh, okay. Well, that's cool. So that's probably not accurate. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's in Texas, but it could be accurate, Gail. Well, I'm just saying, you know, I'm just saying, you know. So uh, let's call it, though, and see if it is and, and report point. back on that. 
and 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 for the time being, good job for for looking it up. But you know what I'm saying? We always trying to call these numbers and stuff before we, we double check to make sure that. The no, I mean seriously. Good. I've had some recent uh recent pissed off moments my own self. You know, just uh calling something and going. What do you mean there? It's you know, there's nobody here ever, or so. I mean, and it's still online. You know, and I'm like, oh, what the heck is this about? So yeah, good job. And I th repeat the number one more time because I think it is correct. Actually, it's one eight 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 two five two nine nine seven zero. Okay, and I I'm, I think it probably is. It sounds very familiar to me. So. Yes. It it, okay. it is. I, I'd imagine it is. It is correct yeah. in this case. And they also the suicide prevention hotline is also provided. And of course, nine one one in the case of the emergency. Yeah, and the quickie number for suicide too. I'm not going to say it because I get it messed up sometimes. It's just three digits. It is, and we covered it not too yeah, long. Yeah, I know. Ago. That's why I'm not going to repeat it again because I might get it wrong. You know. So I don't, I don't, I'm not thinking about committing suicide because I wouldn't be able to remember the number. It's 611. <laughs> I believe it's 611 is what I'm seeing. I think it's 866. See what oh, I'm saying? I think it's 23. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, am I? Uh, well, there's several. There's several. Oh, well, we'll do it now. Let's I'm, do it again when we have all the list of stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at them in front of me right now. Oh, oh good. And uh, there's... You know, there's several right now that I'm seeing. There's 988. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's the one. 988. Yeah. See, I always go. I always say something else because you know, I, you would think I was dyslexic or something. I mean, sometimes, blue, you know, but I'm not. But anyway, so okay, so tell it. Okay, telehealth appointments, telephone appointments, vet center program. Oh, vet centers. We ought to cover the vet center sometime. That'd be a good thing because people would like to know that those things exist. And uh, there are mobile medical units that the VA has. That's like the ones that they put out there uh, on the streets for the senators and stuff and people that might have been traumatized during uh, January 6th events and stuff. Um, you know, so they have those mobile units too. Then urgent care centers. Now, I don't know what an urgent care center is with regard to the VA. You know, that's not a CBOC. Ah, I, you know, in my research that I was looking briefly, yeah. I think I think that's something we can revisit and answer yeah, let's you know, and let's clarify do. later. Uh, it, it's a little confusing just to look at right now and give you a straight answer. That's right. Answer. You're looking at something and I've got a print out here and I'm, I'm starting to go. Uh, and then walk in clinics. They have that listed separately. So they have urgent care centers and walk in clinics. Now, is the CBOC also walking? Let's just go ahead and talk about that when we can do a whole report on it. You know what I'm saying? Good and then questions. emergency rooms. You know, and sometimes your your care provider may ask uh, for a, a your your care provider can pull in a specialist from somewhere else in the hospital and do an electronic assessment also. So that's kind of a cool thing to know. So contacting your your uh, your GP, your general practitioner in the old days, you know, that person is always a good thing to do. So, you know what? I think this is a good thing that we've talked about wait lists and stuff. Um, let's move on to another subject. Let you talk for a while. My throat's getting sore. <laughs> <laughs> what you want to talk about? Well, I don't know. I'm thinking maybe... Maybe uh, CTRS or Vets uh, Row. CTRS. Or no. whichever subject you choose to pull up first there is fine with me. Yes, uh, of course, CTRS. I know what we were we were going to visit, and I don't know if Franco has the video keyed up, but I know we, we had a video, and we're going to cover uh, the tents outside of the West LA VA because I get a lot of questions from people yeah. who know I'm a veteran and know that I've come through uh, the West LAVA. And they always ask me, what are all those tents doing uh, outside on the wall there? Or what are the tents doing inside on the wall there? And I wanted to talk about it a little bit to A, clarify uh, for anyone who had those questions that's asking me, because I have to answer it a lot, but also uh, 
Also let the veterans know that I'm thinking about them inside the tents, inside, and of course, outside on the wall, I'm thinking of them. I have gone, and if you've, if you've driven by San Vicente Boulevard in the West LAVA, you're going to see a row of tents out there. The veterans call that Veterans Row. There's about, there's more than two dozen tents lined up. They're numbered. And what you have is veterans uh, living in those tents and there's American flags. And I think that gets a lot of people's attention because they're seeing American flags and homeless veterans in tents out there. Obviously having been a homeless veteran, it's something I can relate to. And I know from my personal experience and that's all I can share from for here. But I know when I was out there, say I was maybe on Ocean Ave, that's in Santa Monica if, 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 for uh -huh. our viewers who aren't, aren't familiar with Los Angeles area. And there's Ocean Avenue and the beach is right there. And when you're homeless during the daytime, it feels good, right? You're like, I'm right near the beach. Then at night it changes, right? It gets cold, it gets lonely. Windy, and all of a sudden, windy. It gets and windy, it yes. Away. Terrible. Particularly why it's not a great idea to sleep near the beach. I tried that in Venice and it was so freezing cold, I had to bounce. I thought it's too cold to sleep near the beach. But I was always looking for the VA because I did in the back of my mind remember that I was a veteran. And I was trying to, but I didn't know Los Angeles very well. I was coming from Santa Clarita. So I didn't know my bearings, but I knew that the West LA VA was nearby and I didn't quite know how to get there from Ocean Avenue. But that was my journey, was to get there to Ocean Avenue. And, and if I had seen those tents that size, of course, that would have been Shangri-La. And then of course, I know VA building 257, Mm -hmm. does offer showers. That's the Welcome Center on the West LAVA campus. Right. And at the time, this is pre-COVID, so I don't know what the protocol is or SOP is now for the Welcome Center. But I know at the time, you could do laundry. Laundry was provided for homeless veterans. You could do laundry there. And you could also shower there as well. Now, being from Santa Monica, the, the OPCC also, or people's concern also provides showers and toiletries and things like that for the oh, veterans. I didn't know that. Yes, yeah, hot showers, hot showers. Ooh, it's amazing. Nice, nice. Yes. Oh, here we go. This Here's is the video. The this is Veterans Row uh, for our viewers. This is what I'm talking about. These are the tents. Uh, just doing a tracking shot and seeing our veterans. And as you can see, the veterans are, are, are keeping the area pr pretty clean. When I got to the West LAVA in 2018, none of these tents were here, but there were the homeless lined up. Not all veterans at that time. Just there was a homeless encampment. The police would come by, sweep it, and clean the area. Now you see veterans there who are keeping the area clean, and there's not a big trash heap there. That would happen every couple of months uh, when I was there back in 2018. So to see uh, what's there can now. We, can I say something? These these big tents are something that, okay, so just one second. There's, there's a difference between an initiative and a program. And this tent, see, now that, I, see, I want to clear this up in case anybody's confused because um, this area out is outside of the VA with these tents that we just saw. That's out on, what did you say, San Vicente? That's on San Vicente Boulevard. Okay, now on inside the VA, there's a tent camp and initially they started out with little pup tents. And that has, even though it's an initiative and not a full out permanent program, that was brought into being during um, pandemic, uh, Corona and pandemic yeah. and stuff. I mean, that's yeah. how that initially came to be. So there were pup tents because it was nice weather. And then they put down platforms. Then they brought in, they do have showers over there. They have a television tent and media area now, which is really cool. Uh, they have, uh, 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 people that come in and pick up trash around the outside, but the veterans are obligated to uh, dump their own trash and things, anything inside their tent, there's an area for them and a dumpster to, to clean that up. But it appears that they are. So that's the good news. Go ahead. I just wanted to separate the no, two. No, no. Well, I think I think there's some, there's some definitely room for clarity because yeah, the veterans role, what we're seeing outside the wall was those tents, the larger tents were donated in response to the tent camp that was popping up on the inside uh, right. that we know, which I know for a fact falls under CTRS, which right. is the Care Treatment Rehabilitative Services. Now, right. 
the veterans that are inside on the great lawn now do have access to those wraparound services. And my understanding is a lot of those veterans are enrolled in the VA system and being uh, treated for different things, right? On the outside wall, I cannot, I, my understanding is that's not officially a part of CTRS. So I, I think that there may be a move for veterans that want to be uh, integrated into the VA system, but not all veterans on the outside wall are integrated is my understanding. And I don't have great visibility. I've only brought, I brought food with the Mindful Veteran Project. We will go right. out there and talk to veterans. We'll bring don't food I out there. I know a lot of these veterans uh, because I've, I've seen them on campus. And it's, it's, a, it's a great touch point for me. Uh, and I just wanted to, you know, give them a shout out and let them know that they're not forgotten, they're veterans. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that, and of course make that distinction between CTRS and the veterans on the outside wall for our viewers who may not know exactly what's going on with that. Well, I also wanted to give a shout out to the social workers who are the, have, it is, well, everything's our job when it's assigned to us. You know how in the military it says, you know, this is your job. And then at the end it says, and all other duties as assigned. But um, the social workers are responsible for the setup and teardown of these tents. And that's not actually their job. I'm hoping that they will eventually have extend this contract of clean up people or whatever so that on Tuesdays and Thursdays they can have a setup situation where people, you know, they say we need four more tents set up. And, you know, because the social workers are out there to do intake and, you know, there's somebody there on the VA campus. Nobody is outside monitoring things, but inside it's a little bit safer situation um, because I saw some article about a car hitting uh, some tents or something here at the beginning of the month. Uh, some kind of SUV accident or something and injured like three people. But I don't have all the particulars on that. But what I'm yeah. saying is that doesn't happen inside on the VA facility. That's on the street is a, just a different situation. But like you said, you just showed that video and they are keeping things cleaned up. Oh, I mean, absolutely. You can tell veterans, look, I, I, I you know, yeah. I, having been homeless, I'm able to identify the homeless that have been veterans, I mean, that, that the training kicks in, you're in survival mode. So the training yeah. kicks in, you'll see that veterans who, have, who are experiencing homelessness usually have everything as tight as it can be. You know, I, I've been, uh, there's a veteran near me that I, I have not been able to bring in yet or speak to, but I know he's a veteran. I've seen the camo pants and I also see the way he sleeps at night. I see mm -hmm. the way his tent is, is clean. I'm looking at it again. It is yes, clean. it's totally clean out there, uh, which is new. It, this is not how this place used to look, uh, you know, a, a couple years ago. It was something that had to be cleared out uh, every couple months because of the accumulation of junk and trash. And this he needs is, these heavier tents because the winds have been horrendous. And, and yes. it's the kind of thing that we need a tree to come and tear down and set up these tents when people move out of them a lot of times they leave things behind you know their belongings and stuff of and, course you of know course. And the social workers are like you know having to put that someplace I, so. I will say gail i it's not just social workers there's a lot of peer support peer, peer support specialists are out there too oh, okay. uh, and they do a lot of the heavy lifting out there the peer support specialists are doing a lot of the heavy lifting out there and of course i i identify with what you're saying and i know what what you're saying I, i'm sure we'll be able to cover that more later as well I think we're talking about maybe the same thing. Aren't social workers called no, social worker peer no. support specialists? No, those are two different things. I, I, I know social worker is a social worker. Peer support specialist is uh, usually a veteran like myself who is trained in peer support that's working with another uh, veteran. So that, okay. that would be okay. peer support specialist training. Whereas, and they're on the ground over there working with CTRS too, but also there's social worker available too. Um, you know, I, I think we could, you know, there could be psychiatrists, CNAs, LVNs, health techs, hazmat, sanitation workers. There's a lot that could go around to help with that situation. But the important right. thing is, is that uh, there's veterans and, and they have a place to stay in a and uh, at least the 10 over their head uh, out there right now. And, and awesome. safe away from COVID, there was testing out there. Remember when we covered it before, 
COVID oh, yeah. testing was actually happening at the height of the pandemic uh, for veterans out there. I think they do now too, because I went yes. by the day before yesterday and I saw that and I don't know if it was active or not, but I saw the sign was still up and, you know, that this is where COVID testing is. You yes. know who you know who I know went out there to check out the tents and everything? And I'm just going to say this, and I don't usually talk about Dr. Braverman uh, by naming him, but he was out there helping put up a tent one day because I saw him. Somebody said, oh, well, are you out here to help? And he says, sure. And they had him, you know, hold the other side of the tent and get it. So I think everybody on some level, I, I mean, I would just like to have a regular contracted workers that do it every Tuesday and Thursday is what I'm saying. You know, well, so I hear what you're saying. Yeah, week. I hear what you're saying. I, I like that about veteran leadership. You know, I, I mean, well, even, I in know. My, even in my former job, you know, I know that when I was in the corporate world, which I don't like to talk about right now, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but when I was in the corporate world, there was a, you know, it was a Marine that hired me. It was a Marine that that uh, gave me a shout out here at the corporate world, and. You know, during Thanksgiving and different things, he would also serve the he would serve the employees at the time, which meant a lot to me. And of course, uh, you know, I know, uh, as you mentioned, Dr. Braveman does the same thing. And I like that about veteran leadership. Uh, it's something that that really stands out to me as a veteran, because it's 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 it implies that there's a servant leadership style that mm -hmm. uh, I found to be one that I gravitate toward. I also uh, utilize. Too, right, Mac yeah. and, and uh, Braverman, yes, yes, uh, Dr. Yes. Braverman, excuse me, yes, were both yes, out yes. there uh, serving food one day or something and chatting it yes, up with yeah, you guys. for veteran veteran uh, appreciation day. I also have a plaque on my wall, which I it's it's on my wall next to the uh, chapel near Congressman Lou's uh, for Veterans Day. I have that. And I have the Veteran Appreciation Day that was given to me by Dr. Braverman and by uh, Mac as well. And also the uh, chapel poster that you gave me. I don't have anything on my walls in here pretty much except for those things, which mean a lot to me. Yeah, well, that's cool. I'm glad to see you put that chapel thing up. That's a heck of a poster. Yeah, it really is. I really it's appreciate nice it. It's on my wall. Yeah, well, And cool. so it's the, the Veterans Day conversation that... Uh, I participated in too. That recognition is on my wall next to it. Those are the things that mean a lot to me. I, I really, I really gravitate toward veteran working with veterans, obviously, because I've experienced being a homeless veteran, you know. I hear you. I hear you. Me too. Huh. Well, I'll tell you what, um, we have another uh female pilot. Ah, yes, yes that we we wanted to honor um if you guys could set that up together and uh, organize those pictures and you read that or whatever uh that would be cool and then then we'll do vaccine stuff after that can you lead us into that Gil, and tell us why we're doing that well this month is uh women in the military history month and so we have tried to, uh, we promoted the memorial in Washington, D.C. for women. And this is a special one. Actually, I want to give credit where credit's due. Uh, Nicholas and I didn't come up with this story. It was our producer back there, uh, MC Franklin, that brought this to our attention. And we absolutely want to honor this woman and uh, show some pictures and talk about what her experience was in the military and about her. So yeah. you just go for it. Absolutely. And who Gail is talking about is Captain Rosemary Mariner. And Rosemary Mariner began with humble beginnings as a, as a military brat from Texas. She's the daughter of an Air Force pilot and a Navy nurse. She was bound to be special, right? By 17, she had her pilot's license. And by 19, graduated from Purdue University as the first woman to earn a degree in aeronautics, the science of practice of travel through air. In 1974, she became one of six women to earn her wings and become an aviator. When she became one of the first Navy jet pilots, she flew A-4C and A-7E Corsair II. In 1984, not only did she become one of the first women to serve as a surface warfare officer, she became the first woman to command an operational aviation squadron during Desert Storm in 1991. As she continued knocking down barriers, she faced fierce resistance from the military and civilians about the role that gender 
should play in service. After 24 years of service, she earned the rank of captain, accumulated more than 3,500 flight hours in 15 different aircrafts. She became a professor of military history and worked with the Department of Defense and members of Congress to advocate for women in the military and to overturn laws preventing women in combat from serving. When she died in 2019, the U.S. Navy honored her with a missing man flyover that featured an all-female crew, another first for the U.S. military. Captain Rosemary Bryant Mariner, we honor her service, and we just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Yes, absolutely. Good job. Thank you. Wow, that was a good one. That was a bunch of hot women there. I'll tell you, they were looking good in all those uniforms, man. They were just looking fine. I, I don't know what you're talking about, Gail. I mean, <laughs> <is she right? laughs> no, I'm saying, you know, if you're looking good, you're looking good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. What a bunch of, yeah, that's really cool. Well, I'll tell you, I know that we've got some, uh, vaccine information to come up with. Let's just chat it up about the vaccine. You know, yeah. we told that story about, you know, you going over to support me and stuff one day and shooting a video and everything. And, yes. you know, about the Russian guy being in line ahead of me and everything. I mean, that was hysterical. You know, I'll just say it real quick. So what Nicholas and I are standing there and all of a sudden the nurse says, so is everybody here a veteran? And we all went, yes, yes, we're veterans. Well, get out your identification so that, you know, when you come up, I would check your ID. So here's this guy in front of me and she says, sir, are you a veteran? And he says, yes, I am. And he hands over his ID just emphatically like that. And she looks at him and she says, sir, you're a Russian veteran. <laughs> You know, Nicholas and I are standing there going, what? And all of a sudden, all the guys just kind of move out at an angle to get a look, you know, at what the heck is this guy doing Not in doing. our line? But it doesn't say American Veteran Hospital. It says Veterans Hospital. So he thought it was for all veterans around the globe. Can you imagine? No, I cannot imagine because this is a true story. This did I know. <laughs> And I looked at you and you looked at me and you go, this can't be right. This didn't. This, 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 this. Yeah. And so well, uh, the, the cool thing is people were checking. No, you have to be in America, a veteran of the United States in order to get the vaccine. They were doing at their the job. They were so, doing uh, their job. You heard it here on Voice of the Veteran. You have I to be mean, a if you go to the VA, you better have an ID and show it because you were not going to get in there unless you are because it's no. veterans. Doing a great job out there. Yeah. West LA VA. I'm telling you, I'm just impressed. Every time they do anything comes up about vaccines or whatever else, it's just, you know. Well, I know we, we, what we were going to do is. It's been a while. We received, I know I received my second shot vaccination on February 5th. Here we are at the end of March, but we never really shared fourth, with our viewers. Fourth. Right. You, yes, Gail was. I was the third. I mean, you were the next oh, day. I was the fourth. Okay, right. you're right. My brother. No, my no, brother that's why I know that because we did this you're together. Right. You're right. I, I am, but I'm, I was February 4th. Gail was February 3rd. Yeah. Uh, so it's been a while, but here we are. It's March 28th. And we were just going to share a little bit about where we are with that second shot uh, for our viewers and just cover that because right now we know yeah, there's still vaccination going on. Oh, here we go. This, this is a big three. deal. No pinch. He said, and I feel absolutely right. nothing. Go ahead anytime you want to. Oh, did you do it? I did it. You're done. Nada. No Gail's deal. always got to be hard. You see, see, Gail's got to be hard all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an airborne trooper. I'm used to air gun shots. 
You know, when they come by and pass the hundred of us and go boom, 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 boom. I guess they don't do that anymore, but they- They did they, it when I, they did it for me. I, I don't know they, if they do it anymore, but I, I went through that whole day. It's a whole day of that. Oh like, man. It's a whole day of those shots. Boom, boom. There is yeah. no end to the vaccinations that you get in the military. Then you got your little card and boy, you know, you're saying stamp that sucker, stamp that sucker. I need proof that I actually got that shot. Oh man. They do. They just, I mean, they just don't stop, you know? Oh, we got oh, here's, here's one. one. What are you doing here? What are you doing? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. Dumb. You get it? Nice. I didn't feel it. Yeah, see? I mean, not really. I didn't feel it that time. I had to check the band-aid to make sure I actually got the shot. Okay. Yeah. Well, I know with all those muscles, you'd be thinking that, you know, that was an alley, but no. No, well, you know what I was thinking, though, Gail, in, in, in uh, something uh, MC and I were talking about uh, earlier is that that first shot for me was like all muscle intense, but I also think it could have been the tension of like eight months or nine months of being in a pandemic situation, not knowing what was going to happen. Yes. I, I, I seemingly was cool, but my body was still tensed up from all of the stress, I think, from having gone, you know, being in a pandemic. Now, one of the cool benefits of that first shot is as I moved toward, uh, I think, what, 50% Im immunity uh, toward that second shot, you know, it's like this old cloak of, of, Fear and uncertainty starts to fall away and yep. then leading up to the second shot. So by the time I'm sitting there, I know, well, at the very least, I'm, I'm what, 50 percent, maybe 33 percent vaccinated. Uh, so it just wasn't the same uh, feeling. I didn't go into the second shot the same way. In fact, and it was retractable. So it it it, you know, it yeah. goes right in and then, it, you know, then the needle's gone and I'm looking at the needle and there's no needle. And I'm like, wait a second. But it's a retractable shot. So for anybody there who's so wondering or saying there's not really vaccinations, it's just a retractable shot. It does retract after the shot. And there was blood on my Band-Aid afterwards and everything that, like that. And then the rest of that cloak has started to fall away for me of uncertainty. And I have trust in the vaccine. I, I flew for the first time. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't here uh, one week. I was in Texas. I, I You know, I'll share with our, our viewers. I was actually uh, attending a funeral out there, but it gave me an opportunity to fly. You know, mm -hmm. I did not fly during uh, when I did not have the vaccination. I flew this time back and forth without uh, fear, really. I was masked up, but of course I was able to fly. I was able to go to Texas and stay in Texas and uh, everything was open out there. So I was in restaurants. I was in uh, Top Golf, you know what I mean? Uh, so, and I came back, even went to hot yoga. I did hot yoga for the first time out there. Really? And uh, yeah, and you know what? Was that, was that a Wounded Warriors thing? You know what? I saw it on Randolph Air Force Base. I was actually at Randolph Air Force Base a lot. I know that the Wounded Warriors does offer that. My particular hot yoga was not uh, through Wounded Warriors, but I know there's a lot offered. There's actually a Wounded Warrior building on Randolph Air Force what? Base. Oh, the yes, yes, there's actually a building there. Do we the have one of those in LA? Do we have one of those in LA? I don't know. I can't speak to that. Well, I know I'm just I saw, saying, I think we need one. If Texas has got one, precedent is set. Let's get one. If, there there know, is one on campus. There, there is one on the base. Uh, wow. So, yeah, that was my experience. So I, all I can do is speak for Pfizer and the VA. I just want to give a great big thank you to the West LA VA and the VA in general for my vaccine. I tested it uh, in Texas, and I'm back on the show, and I feel great. So... That, that was, was my so much, shot You're right. You're right. I was so much calmer because you were there too, the second shot. But I'm telling you, uh, the first time when I went for my first shot, I had to sit in the car for a while. I'm telling you, I was texting people. Just, I mean, I was anxiety. It was terrible. It was like, oh man, I don't want to go into a hospital with all these sick people. Oh my God. You know, and uh, it wasn't the shot. It was the anxiety around and about and before you know, just knowing that it's this, this is something I want to do. 
This is something I've studied about. I want messenger RNA in my body. I think it's a wonderful thing. And I mean, and all the new, have you heard about the new CRISPR technology? You were telling me a little bit about it, but no, I don't, I don't know a lot about well, there's it. There's this new woman, she's getting like a Nobel Prize or something, and she wrote a book on CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R, not E-R, but R, CRISPR technology. And I'll just real quick tell you what I know about it, because I think it's exciting. So you got DNA and you got RNA, you know that. And then you've got DNA and it doesn't, RNA is what does the work the actual job of fixing things. Um, CRISPR technology, now I understand that they can actually eliminate uh, sickle cell anemia in people's bodies. Um, this is, it, I saw a little animated thing on it where they had the, the helix, you know, that twisted ladder looking thing, you know, with the little chromosomes and all that kind of stuff. Well, they showed it where they took out a little piece that was damaged, that was a, a sick section. And they took, got a new one and plugged it in and put it back in the person's body. And then it starts replicating and doing its thing in the very same way that the virus replicates. I mean, it just fixes it. All it needs is that introduction and that new little part of the ladder put in that's that's good and healthy and new, and you don't, don't have it anymore. <laughs> How's that, that even possible? Where, where is I mean, that? Where is that coming from? Where, the, the, where does uh, the RNA come from? Yes, where is where does where where does the message where does here the healthy, too? I want to acknowledge. Where does the healthy? Uh, oh, that you know, Marilyn Moore come from. Oh, I see someone said something. Oh, I think she's uh, just saying good info. Information, Gail. Yeah, you know thank I don't you. know. Thank I you guess. More. Yeah, I think developed in a lab because that's just like with uh, the vaccine. They develop this this messenger RNA in a lab, and it's 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 like the the messenger RNA could actually be changed to um, combat other variants of the virus I is oh, what I'm reading. You know, that's I'm not speaking to this as an authority. This is just what I've read because no, 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 no. I do read about this stuff and it's, it's important, you know, to, to understand it because who the heck wants to go get a vaccine if you haven't read something about it or know that, and you're, you know, people are talking and telling stories. They don't know what they're talking about and they need to study and make a decision, you know, because <laughs> what about you know, what about side effects? I know I know there's oh, yeah. a lot of people who haven't gotten that second shot yet. And I'll say one thing that we didn't cover is that I know Gail and I both specifically did not get the shot on the same our second shot on the same arm that we yeah. got the first one. I don't know Left why arm, we you know right we just yeah. went opposite arm on the second shot. Yeah. Uh my side effects were this I got home, I felt okay. I didn't have the arm soreness like I did on the first shot, but that night I felt mm -hmm. loopy, right? All of a sudden at night I got loopy. Uh, I'd say it was about four hours of just kind of feeling like real loopy and out of my head, right? And I just went to sleep. Uh, I tried to drive for a second. I said, no, no, I'm going to. I drove right to Popeye's Chicken, actually. I drove right to Popeye's Chicken and walked in and turned around and said, no way. I can't do this. I don't know what's going on. I went I took myself in. I went to sleep. And then whatever that loopiness was and that woozy feeling that lasted maybe four or five hours, I went to sleep, woke up, and I was fine. And I didn't have any other side effects other than that. It happened the same night I got the shot. I was just a little out of my head for about four or five hours. And that was my second shot experience as far as side effects went. I, I, I know that when I raised my arm, I could feel where I was physically given the vaccine and my arm kind of ached, raise it up in the air. So I put ice on it and stuff and, and it was fine. I do recall being not having a headache, but feeling headachy for about a half an hour. At about two hours afterwards, I felt headachy, and I hadn't done anything that I think would have caused that. But it was very limited. I mean, 
in any reaction. Like I said, thickly, my arm lifting it up and down was was the biggest thing. I felt it. That's why I wanted to change to a different arm. I want another shot in the same arm a month apart, you know. So I just turned, I said, now put this one in the right arm, put this one in the left arm. And, you know, and I'm glad I did that uh, just for the physical, you know, point of being stabbed with a needle, you know. Yes, yes. So, well, you know, I, they, I there's think, a lot of other vaccines too. Yes. But, I think it's good that we say that because I know that uh, that experience is different for a lot of people. My mother, while I was in Texas, my mother got her second shot. And I believe that was last Sunday. It's been a week. So she got her second oh, shot last Sunday. Her. Yes, they, the whole house did. The whole house got their second and shot. My mom did too. My mom got her second yeah. shot. Yeah. And thankfully... Uh, all over 65 and everybody was fine. I think only one of my aunts had a brief, uh, had some flu-like symptoms. You know, she didn't feel so great that day. But, I, I, but I'm saying the reason I wanted to say what my experience was is because it's a little different for everybody. But And I know some people have experienced flu-like symptoms and things like that. So I wanted to cover what, what happened with me and, of course, Gail uh, sharing what, what happened with her on that second shot. My mother didn't have any side effects and she's over 65. Oh, well, that's nice. And and I should say that the women's uh, the women's health clinic at VA West LA is having a town hall all about vaccines. I know they have a panel. I know that Tess Banco is going to be on the panel from a family wellness center and all that kind of stuff. So that's going to be a really nice thing to get good information there. And also on this show, I want to make sure that we talk about other vaccines as well because there are other things out there that are available to veterans at the VA hospital, everything from the pneumonia shot, to shingle shot, to the yearly flu shot, to tetanus shot. I mean, if you're working out in your yard and, and you know, and you're digging around and, and you know, might get uh, rusty, you know, you definitely want to have a tetanus shot in a few years. So, you know, that stuff is available to us. Uh, you know, the coronavirus uh, 19 is not only the only virus out there. Right. You know, I, so I know. we want to be safe and, and you know, look at that. Well, you know, I've gotten yeah. most of those. I, I think I'm current on pretty much all of them. You know, the one I'm not current on, and that's just my veteran stubbornness. I was thinking I didn't get a flu shot this year. <laughs> that was the only one. But I have the pneumonia. Oh. I have the hips. I have every other one, but flu, I was like, well, wait a second. I'm sanitizing myself. I'm wearing a mask everywhere. I, I don't think I'm getting this flu shot. But it's true. But, but you know why I did? You know why I did? Because I didn't what? want twindemic. Because I didn't want to get flu and corona at the same time and them have to sort that out as to which one it is. Because if I ever did get corona, I didn't want them to have to be confused. I mean, you know, so that's why you know that was my Full you know. disclosure, you know why I didn't get the flu shot? I didn't think I could psychologically handle it. Because I was like, <laughs> if I get a reaction from the flu shot, I'm going to think I've got COVID and it's going to mess with me. I'm going to be like, I've got, right. I got COVID. I don't want the flu shot because I don't want to mess with my hand, you know? <laughs> but, so I skipped it this year, but I will be back on point next year with my flu shot. Uh, but I skipped it this year uh, and I got the COVID vaccination. Yeah, I'll tell you. Well, at least we're doing it, you know, as much as we can do it, you know. I mean, hey, why don't we go out to lunch sometime, for goodness sakes? I'll buy. Well, yeah, we can do that now. Yeah, we can That's do right. that. We can do that That's now. That's what I'm thinking. That yeah, would be we nice. We can do that now. I hadn't thought of that. Absolutely. Yes. We can go I, like sugar, I like sugar fish. <laughs> That's, a, that fish an LA joke. Yeah. That's an L.A. joke. Uh, <laughs> but no, I know we're going to uh, tell our viewers to have a good week soon, but I wanted to shout out that the second part of the series that the American Legion Post 578 and Watts Labor Community uh, Action Committee, uh, the WLCAC, uh, are hosting is taking place for 1421. It's going to be between, it begins at nine o'clock AM and it's going to end at one o'clock PM. And of course it's, it's a partnership between uh, the greater Los Angeles veterans and the American Legion post 578 and the Watts labor community action committee. And it's going to be on four, April 14th 
21. That's just the second part of that series from 9 o'clock a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. And that's for veterans of all ages. Veterans of all ages can be mm -hmm. vaccinated uh, mm -hmm. at this uh, you know, opportunity for COVID vaccinations. I think they passed a legislation, saves lives or something, you know, where now caregivers and all the ages and whatever can be vaccinated if you're connected to a VA. So that, that's yes, that's what I have. I called, now I still get my uh, healthcare through HPAC, but I was told by my, uh, my practitioner, hey, the age restriction has been eliminated for Greater Los Angeles VA COVID vaccinations. And of course, if you're interested, that number is 310-268-4900, 310 310-268. Four nine zero zero, and that's I'm better. Memorize. I almost got a tattoo. Right. <laughs> 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 but I know. Well, 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 we got wrap and recap. Uh, yeah. What was your I, takeaway? Oh, well, I'll tell you what mine is because I already looked this up online, and that access thing about how long it takes uh, for you to uh, sit in a waiting room with Elvis whatever, uh, you know, uh, to know how long you're going to be someplace. Now you can schedule your life and the VA isn't just assuming that your time doesn't mean anything. They have spent a lot of time developing this information for us. So, you know, use it already. I mean, access that and, uh, and uh, know how long you're going to be there. You know, I mean, it's accurate information from veterans. How long did you wait? 30 minutes? Okay, we'll write it down and put it online. I mean, you know, what do you want? You know, that's a good thing. Thank you, VA, for doing that because I hated sitting there. Trust me, you know, uh -uh. and especially now when everybody's wearing masks. You think I want, I want to know how long I'm going to be in that room because I want to know what my viral load exposure is. You know what I mean? Ah, yes, yes, yes. That's something, maybe a topic we can discuss uh, on a future episode. Viral load matters. That's something I was very uh, aware of in Texas was, was viral load, particularly when Ooh, I was in all those open spaces like that. The viral load still matters, right? Uh, yes, and does. I can feel my body fighting. So that's it's something, that's, that's just me. Uh, but yeah, viral load mattered in my situation and I was very aware of it. Um, I think my takeaway is, uh, you know, that the U.S. Navy honored uh, Captain uh -huh. Rosemary Bryant Mariner with yes. the uh, with with a all female crew, um, and that was the first for the U.S. military as far as the flyover, uh, the missing man flyover went. So uh, my takeaway was Captain Rosemary Bryant Mariner. And, and thank you, and, Franco, for giving us that information. That was really a good job. I appreciate you bringing that up. And I know he caught it because she was a military brat and he is a military brat. So, you know, it kind of caught his attention. But good for you for finding a good subject. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, wrap this up and say this has been the Voice of the Veteran Show. Thank you for watching this week. I hope you'll join us again next week. I think we're both going to be here, aren't we, Nicholas? Yes, we'll be here next oh, wow. week. Shout out to uh, Marilyn Moore. Thank you for being with us. Thank you to everybody watching The Voice of the Veteran. See you next week. Bye-bye. See you next week. <laughs>